Hello and welcome back to another video. I've had a small change of plans on what this video was supposed to be. I was looking to do something on instrumentation amplifiers and for that I was going to require a Wheatstone bridge and some strain gauges. Well the strain gauges seem to have disappeared in the postal service and until I get some new ones I'm going to have to just do a an interim piece and I thought the perfect one to do would be something on the Wheatstone Bridge that we're going to be using in our instrumentation amplifier. If you need a device that can accurately measure very small changes in resistance, the Wheatstone Bridge is still the way to go. So we'll talk about how to do a calculation for the unknown resistance and a little bit about how it works and of course the applications that are available or that it's still useful for. So let's go ahead and get started with the video. Now this is your typical standard average everyday Wheatstone bridge. Nothing too exciting about it probably to many of you, but we'll go over it and, and do some analysis of it anyways. What the Wheatstone Bridge can do, and incidentally it wasn't invented by Wheatstone, it was invented by a man named Christie. At least he designed it, and he came up with it quite a few years before Wheatstone started using it. But Wheatstone, I suppose, saw the paper and, and came up with some applications and experiments, and he's the one that made it famous, even though Christie came up with it. The thing we can do with a Wheatstone Bridge is find a unknown resistance and we can do that with great precision and of course that precision is going to be dependent on the precision of all of the resistors that are in the circuit and how steady we can keep the voltage make sure that it doesn't vary and then of course our measuring device being able to measure a unknown resistance let's say it was R3 in this case would give us the ability to determine a value for anything that has a variable resistance in it. Uh, light detecting resistors, some gas detectors have resistive elements in them. In the, pre in the presence of certain gases, their resistance changes. And of course, we're going to be using a strain gauge. And the one that I hope to get soon is that 120 ohm version. And that's why I put 120 ohms in this circuit to make everything simple and nice transition to a future video. So in a balanced circuit, a balance means that the voltages between points A and points B come out to be zero. There's no difference between these two points. For that to be true, uh, we would have to have the same current going through R1, R2 as we have going through R3 and R4. So just think of these as being these two leads here is being just straightened out and moved over a little bit and then these two over here. So we have two parallel branches and because the resistance is the same throughout, the currents and the voltages should be identical. With five volts applied and, and any voltage that we apply to a bridge is typically called an excitation voltage and the voltage that's across this point from A to B is the sensing voltage and that's often called S minus, and that's typical. S minus is going to be what we have as point A, and S plus would be what I have as point B. So if I do this, I know that I have five volts going through this branch and five volts going through this branch. There's not going to be any current going through here, and that's because the voltages at these two points should be identical. So if I have that one branch and it's 120 ohms, I'm going to get 20.83 repeating milliamps through R1, and that would be IR1. Well, that same current, IR1, would go through this resistor, IR2, or R2, and give us an IR2 of also 20.83 milliamps. So it's just a series circuit at this point. There's no current flow through here because we also have 20.83 milliamps here, which is IR3, and we have the same 20.83 milliamps at IR4. Well, that's going to give us a 2.5 volt drop here, 2.5 volt drop here, 2.5 here, and 2.5 
here. So all the voltages are exactly the same. So if I measure from A to B, the difference voltage from here to here is 2.5 minus 2.5, it's zero. So the voltage is zero. I have a balanced circuit. And all of these equations just indicate what we just, you know, essentially did. We know that V1 is equal to V3. V2 is equal to V4. So these two are equal. And we also know that the current in I1 times R1 gives us V1. The current I2 and R2 gives us V2. Since these currents are the same, since these resistances are the same, it's just 2.5 divided by 2.5 equals 2.5 divided by 2.5. That ratio is the same. If the ratio from one side to the other is exactly the same, we are in, we're fine. There's no problems here. If I change these resistors, let's say I made this 240 ohms and made this one 240 ohms, the ratios between these two points are still going to be the same. The currents will be different, but the ratio of the voltages between these two points is still going to be exactly 2.5 volts, and 2.5 minus the 2.5 is still going to give us a zero. So it doesn't matter really what the resistors are as long as the ratio is one to one across the bridge, and that will give us that balanced value. If I have an unknown value, let's say that R3 was an unknown value, I could find what that value is, and again, this is balanced, so it's not going to be a great surprise. If I take R4, which is 120 ohms, and multiply it by the ratio of R1 divided by R2, 120 ohms over 120 ohms. Don't think it's a great surprise to say that 120 divided by 120 is 1 times 120 is 120. So in this case, it's really easy to find that missing value. Well, what happens if we have an unknown value of R3 and R4, R2 are identical? We need to find some way to find that missing value, and we could put a variable resistor into this. So in R1, we could make this a variable resistor. And by varying the value of this resistor, when we get this to be zero, when we null it, it's going to be, again, because of the truth in this equation, it's going to be zero. By way of example, let's say that this was 200 ohms now. At 120, we're definitely going to have a higher current through here. And there's the series for current here is going to be a little bit lower. But this circuit is no longer balanced. Obviously, 200 and 120 are not a balanced value. But if I begin to vary this resistor, bring it up to 200 ohms, when this says 200 ohms, guess what? Because of this set of equations, this must also be 200 ohms. So we can find the missing value of a resistor. That's not really great help because what we would like to do is not have to use some kind of resistor in here to measure another resistor. We want to use the voltages to be able to determine the difference between these two points and use that difference voltage to determine a, a value for either weight or, or a certain amount of gas that's in the air, carbon dioxide, let's say, or how a light, bright a light is. So we're more interested in measuring the difference between one side and the other than balancing it out to find the resistance. Of course, that's if you're interested in doing that, that's the way to go, or one of the ways to go if you don't have a, have a multimeter that can measure this. But it's, one of the nice things about this is, it's again, it's really accurate. And if you have a variable resistor, or let's say a decade box that has, goes down to tenths of an ohm or hundreds of an ohm, which I would like to see, <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it'll give you a good value that way. What I think of as a simpler way to see a balance in the circuit is that we know that the voltage at A and the voltage at B have to be the same. And going back to our original values of 120 ohms, we can just set up a simple voltage divider. And if you followed through the 
transistor circuits that I had done well a couple of years ago and I still do a the voltage divider formula pretty often because it's just it's such a prevalent uh, calculation in transistor circuits you can see that it really is just a simple voltage divider we want to find the voltage on R2 and the total voltage of the circuit again we're assuming a balance would be R1 plus R2 times whatever the voltage is that we're applying and I'm using the voltage on a branch, branch A, so this is branch A and this is branch B. Well the voltages are really identical so that's the same voltage VA and VB are the same same values of 5 volts. So R2 over R1 times R2 120 ohms divided by R1 plus R2, 240 ohms, times the 5 volts, and we end up with 2.5 volts. So the voltage at point A is going to be 2.5, and the voltage at B is 2.5. Again, everything's balanced, and that's great. So what happens when we have an unknown value of resistance? There's a couple of ways to do that. And of course, using the decade box here, we could do that. And I've seen you know examples in textbooks say we have an unknown resistor, adjust this one until you get the same value and then pull out a, uh, a multimeter and, and measure it. Well, if you had the multimeter, you just do that in the first place. But I guess it's an experiment, so it's, it's valid. But let's go through an unbalanced circuit and just use basic Ohm's law and figure out how this is going to, to work. So let me clean things up and I'll be right back. If our circuit is not balanced, we are going to have a difference in potential from point A to point B. So let us say that R4 is different. Something has changed in it. It's no longer 120 ohms. And also let's say that our voltmeter is indicating a value of negative one volt. R1 and R2 are still going to be 2.5 volts. It's not going to change at all at this point. If we used a galvanometer we would have a variation because there's current flowing through it, but the advantage of using a modern uh, digital multimeter on the DC function is that it has a really high input impedance input resistance and we can really isolate or say that these two points are separated because of the really high resistance so we don't have to worry about currents going through here that makes the calculation quite a bit simpler so we know that the voltage at point A is 2.5 volts so let's consider this our reference if we have a value of negative 1 here the B side must be more negative by this value. So we are looking at 1.5 volts at point B. So that's fairly straightforward so far. Well if there's 1.5 volts at point B that's the voltage that's going to be dropped on R4. That's an unknown. So again ignore the 120 ohms. But we do know that we have 5 volts applied to the circuit and that it's a series circuit isolated because of the high resistance of our DMM and we do know that we have a voltage drop of 1.5 volts and we know that the sum of the voltage drops have to equal the applied so if we know that there's 1.5 here the remaining voltage has to be on R3 so 1.5 or 5 volts minus 1.5 gives us 3.5 volts once we know that, 3.5 volts divided by the 120 ohms will give us the current that is going through that branch. And using our handy calculating device, 3.5 volts divided by 120 gives us a current of 29.16. So 29. 0.17 milliamps. Well, if there's 1.5 volts here, again using Ohm's law, we know that V is equal to I times 
are, well, we know V and we know I, so V divided by I will give us the R value, and 1.5 volts divided by 29.17 milliamps gives us a resistance of 51.42 ohms. And that's how it's that's about how simple it is to to use a Wheatstone bridge with known values on one side and variations in values on an unknown value. And again, if you wanted to, you could just as well have put a decade box at this point and adjusted it, but it's unlikely you're going to get the accuracy of 51.42 ohms. And Remember, we're assuming ideal components and perfectly stable voltages. It's unlikely with a decade box you're going to get 51.42 ohms. The resistors, again, that I'm using are plus or minus 0.1%, and they're five part per million, so they're really very stable resistors. And that makes the more sta better these resistors are, the more accurate you can become here. And the more accurate you can become here, the more accurate your measurement will be for the measurement of weight, light, or, or gas density of, of whatever it is that you're trying to, to measure. So for this, going over these values, I essentially have done them already. So measure the difference between A and B. So all we do is put our voltmeter across here and measure the difference voltage. So we have one volt negative. That means that we have one volt less here than we do on our reference side. This is always going to be two and a half volts at point A because that's what we already calculated. Once we have that voltage, that's the voltage that has to be dropped on R4 because we're measuring from here, which is the S plus side to ground. Once we know the voltage here, we can just use Kirchhoff's law and take 5 volts, which is the total, minus the known drop, and that will give us the unknown value. Well, that now is a known value, 3.5 volts, divided by 120 ohms, gave us this current. And since the current is the same in a series circuit, remember these are isolated because of the high impedance here, we now have a 29.17 milliamp current through 1.5 volts, and that gives us 51.42 ohms. Well, what happens if the voltage, let's say it was positive? If it were positive voltage, that would tell us that this point was more positive than this point, which would make this side three and a half volts. Uh, so just remember your polarities and you'll know whether to add or subtract from your, your reference point voltage. So the voltage at A, plus or minus the voltage at B in our case, would give us the voltage at R4. Take our voltage source, our 5 volts, and subtract the 1.5 volts that we had, or it had uh, from our calculation. That's going to give us a voltage on 3, so 1.5 volts will give us the 3.5 here. And take the voltage here, divided by the resistance, gives you the current. That's the current here, and the voltage here divided by that current gives us the resistance. It sounds a, a little bit monotonous, but you get the idea. So if you have one side that you know is going to be stable, 2.5, measure the other side, put your resistor or your voltage device across here, your DMM, measure this, you'll know this value, subtract from the supply, That'll give you this value. Once you know this voltage, you know the current through it because you know the resistance. Then you know the current here, and that is it. So a Wheatstone bridge, really, really great device for measuring unknown values of resistance with great precision and still used quite a bit. Well, the only thing left now is to test all of this out and see if it's true. So we'll get started with that right now. This is the simplest to build circuit that I think we've ever done. So just a, your standard 
Wheatstone bridge again. 120 ohm resistors all around. So these are metal film and they're 0.1%. I've already measured everything with a four wire setup on my DMM. And these are all 120.05, give or take very little from one another. So they're pretty much exactly the same. I'm going to put a 180 ohm unknown resistor into the circuit. Well, we'll call that our unknown and see if the calculations that we just came up with work out for for this particular device or setup and, and see if we were right. So we have our excitation voltage. We're going to put five volts into the circuit here. And of course, that's going to be from top to bottom. And the center section, I'm going to hook up my my key site and make the voltage measurements so I can get something pretty accurate to, to show you guys. Well, let's push some electrons through here, see if they flow the way that we want them to and if everything is, uh, is correct in practice as we assumed it was through theory. As you can see, I've got the power applied. So I have five volts and I've adjusted it to give me as close to five volts as I can possibly get. So my Regal, the indication is uh, it takes an extra seven millivolts to get it to be exactly five, which is pretty good value. I'm measuring across the entire circuit because I want to make sure that the voltage there is indeed five volts. And you can see it drifts up a little bit and it'll do that as, as the temperature varies. So let me pop that down a little bit. My excitation voltage then is the five volts and if I measure from S minus, which is the left side of the bridge, to S plus, which is the right side of the bridge, I should have ideally zero volts. I've got 125 microvolts. And considering, you know, these aren't going to be, these are 0.1%, which is still pretty good. There's still going to be some variation in there. And I could null this out, but by the time that we got through other measurements, it probably would drift again. And it's not going to make a significant difference to our calculations. So, looks good. We have in the 5 volts across our circuit. And you can see it's already drifted a little bit. And that's just by tapping the circuits very slightly, we get, a, get enough drift in there. Make sure I've got a good connections everywhere, of course. There we go. And the one thing that is not going to change in the circuit is our reference voltage. We should always have two and a half volts at S minus. That's going to be the point that doesn't change. That's the way we did it in the example. And in a balanced circuit, the other side should also be 2.5 volts. And measuring from A to B, you can see the difference is zero. So let's put a, another resistor here and then see if we can calculate the value of that resistor based on those little set of equations, just Ohm's law that we did, and find out what that resistor is. So I'm going to turn the power off and insert my resistor. Breadboard's being a little bit recalcitrant. Nothing a little force with some needle nose pliers won't fix. All right, so there we go. And turn the power back on. And now you'll see that I have a difference between this side, which is 2.5 volts, and this side, which is 0.495 volts higher. And through the power of a little bit of video editing, these are the, the values that I have already come up with. So we know that we have a reference of 2.5 volts, and we have, and that's at this point, and we know that the voltage at this point is 0.49572 greater, and again, it's drifting, but we'll stick with that number, which gives us 2.99572 volts across our unknown resistor. And I lost my connection there. Well, if this is dropping 
point or 2.99572 and I have a total of 5 volts our resistor at the top which is R3 must be dropping the remaining voltage which is 2.00428 and I'm going out with all these decimals because we want accuracy and that's what this is good at so let's stick with that and we know that this is 120 ohms it's actually about 120.5 but that will work 120 ohms we have a current then of 16.702 milliamps so down this branch we have 16.702 if we have 3 volts at this point and we have 16.702 milliamps the resistor is 179.36 ohms and if I turn power off and then use my Kelvin clips to make the measurement of that resistor let's see how accurate we actually are and take out the resistor and it's decided to go into the galley there we go got one got two and we come up with 179.42 and 179.36 and to make this even a little bit more accurate let's go ahead and zero the leads and null it and measure it again it's not going to make a big difference but we'll take every advantage we can get so there we go 179.42 not really much difference well we're only off by about what uh, I guess about 60 milli ohms which is not not too bad at all so calculated value and measured value let's try it the other way in this case we'll put the 180 ohm resistor back into the circuit and on this side I'll put a decade box and we'll vary that out to get the null and see if that works as well everything's hooked back up and I still have the 180 ohm resistor so it's not going to be a surprise if I adjust this to get 180 ohms I've got the 120 and if you will recall we had a value difference between S minus and S plus of about half a volt and I've got 120 ohms right now and as I get closer and closer to the actual value and you can see that I'm a little bit low now so let's try going by smaller values and I'm about one millivolt off at this point about two millivolts so that would tell you then that using my variable resistor in this case my decade box and placing that in parallel to the unknown value I can use the decade box to actually determine that unknown value so that works out pretty well so if I were to try another one it wouldn't be surprised we'd get the same thing all right so I pulled another resistor out 270 ohms I'll go ahead and turn power off and move that out of the way take out the old resistor put the new one back in and re reconnect the one that's always popping out and turn power back on and you can see that we're out of null again and let me go up to 200 and start to work my way down and there's 270 271 and still a little bit off so 260 and that's too high and that's the closest we can get so 267 ohms according to the decade box and this time I won't do a 4 ohm measurement I'll just use your standard average everyday 2 and 
go into the circuit, break it so we don't have anything in parallel, and 266.9, and we had 200 and 267, and we had 267. So you can see that it's a really accurate way to do that, and of course, depending on the accuracy of your standard and your resistors. Well, that is it again. That is the Wheatstone Bridge. What we're going to do next is put that 120 ohm resistor back in there and then put in our strain gauge and then hook that up to an instrumentation amplifier so we can see the really small voltages or the really small resistances that are in here and you know, show you how an instrumentation amplifier works. So thanks for watching and until next time, take care.